Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Come on inside the chat. It's eight o'clock, and as promised, I said I was going to come on at eight to have a discussion with you all. Um, a discussion about. Um, change, a discussion about <clears throat> crisis, and a discussion about continuity. Uh, uh, the reason for that was because I have been having some thoughts recently uh, about everything that's happening, uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus that is that is that has taken the world by storm. And in my um, meditations and in my uh, thinkings and, and, and discussions, um, one of the things that I've realized and I've come to uh, the conclusion about is that um, this is not the first crisis we've seen and this is not the only crisis we will see. Um, and, I'm, and I'm specifically gearing uh, millennials tonight, um, not that I have anything against any, anyone else of other um, generations, but particularly the millennials because um, most of us, at the very least, will live at least the next 40, 50 years, 60 years. So that means we will be seeing a lot more crises in our future. So one of the keys tonight, um, or one of the things or the goals I want to accomplish tonight is to help all of us um, manage, um, maximize, and benefit from any crisis that we will see in the future. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not uncommon, it's been done before. We, we're not the first and we're not the last. So come on in, share this broadcast, those who are in already, appreciate you for coming in. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming in. Let me see if I can see who's coming in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Charmaine Wilson, that's my wife, she's in. Nikki Fontaine, uh, she's in as well, Nalai. Uh, she is also in so I'm just gonna give a few more minutes and again guys. I, I have notes So I'm not gonna be um, Drifting uh, I want to be on here for an hour and leave a couple, you know minutes open for Q&A as well uh, Depending on how it goes. So yeah, we, 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 we're gonna jump right into it in a, in a couple minutes a couple seconds actually and then we're gonna get started alright, so Share this broadcast. Let's get the numbers up. Share it, share it, share it. Because I know that there are a couple of millennials in your network that you think need to hear as well. So share it and let them come on in. All right. <clears throat> while, while we're waiting, I uh, just want to let introduce myself for persons who may not know who I am. My name is Darren Wilson. I am from and still live in St. Martin. Uh, that's an island in the Caribbean. And uh, I say I'm, I'm an author, and I'm a speaker, and I'm also an entrepreneur. So as an author, I've written uh, a couple books. I have, I have about three books, here they are right here. Um, one of them is called Got Fruit, right? The other one is called Design for Purpose. And the other one is called the Kingdom Focus Church, right? Now, all three of those books are available on Amazon. Um, you can find them um, uh, when you go to Amazon, www.amazon.com, or you can go to my website, darrenwilsonglobal.com as well, and get yourself a copy of this book. Now, some of the, 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 the material tonight you can find in either one of these two books, Got Fruit or Design for Purpose, but a vast majority of it, um, you won't find in any book because that book hasn't been written yet. <laughs> um, so uh, quite, it's quite possible that this information here will be in a future book. Uh, so you just got to keep a lookout for that because that's the way it works with me. Um, it just started right. Uh, initially, this was a post, but it became too long for a post. So I just converted it into a Facebook Live. All right. So I'm seeing the numbers go up. Uh, good, 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 good. I see Brian Stevens is in. Rosalind Ray is in. All right. So let's just get, let's get started. We're five minutes in already. Okay, good. Now, we are currently in a crisis. Now, that is... That is not 
um, an understatement, it is a legit fact. We are in a crisis. Now, a crisis is an event or a situation. A crisis is an event or a situation over which you have no control, right? You have no control over the situation. That, that is literally what a crisis It's a situation or an event that you find yourself in that you have no control over. So the only thing you can do, the only thing that you can do is learn how to deal with it. In your life, in my life, in our lives, there will be instances and situations where you will come up against circumstances that will seemingly spin out of control and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, same point, what we have going on right now with, with the COVID-19. You have no control over this situation. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's a crisis. Now, for context sake, um, the definition that I want to use for crisis is as follows. A crisis is a situation or an event that brings with it a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger where difficult, important, and unpopular decisions must be made. All right, I'll say that again. For the context of this discussion about crisis, change, and continuity, crisis is defined as a situation or an event that brings with it a time of difficulty, trouble, or danger where difficult, important, and unpopular decisions must be made. That is the definition of crisis that we're going to work with here tonight. All right? So it's a situation or an event. If you, take, if, if you will be honest with yourself, you can see that in, sometimes in your own life, there are situations, there are events that have happened to you that bring immense difficulty. It seems like it's trouble on every side. And where, wherever you look, wherever you turn, it's, it's some sort of trouble. And sometimes dangerous as well. Not, 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 oftentimes not in the sense of life-threatening danger, but mental trauma danger emotional danger you know those are those are all crisis situations and it is in those situations where sometimes you have to make the most difficult important and even unpopular decisions and that my friends is what crisis is so when we talk about crisis and when we are thinking about crisis, and when we are having a discussion about crisis, and when we are deliberating about crisis, and when we are debating about crisis, we have to take into consideration that definition. Okay? Now, because of this current COVID-19, and I'm using COVID-19 because it's the current crisis right now, but this can be applied to any crisis, whether it's a personal crisis or global crisis. Whenever a crisis happens, the world as we know it will change. After this um, global pandemic regarding COVID-19, we will no longer know the world as we know it, or we will no longer see the world as we know it, or we will no longer understand or, or, or be a part of the world as we know it. The world as we know it will change. And we have to be okay and honest with that. So because of that, I want, and also because this will not be the last crisis we face. It will not. It won't be the last crisis from any crisis. Eight ways. Just eight. Eight ways. Somebody write that in the chat room. Eight ways to benefit and maximize a crisis. If you can hear me, if you can see me, give me some hearts, give me some likes. I want to know that you're, you're, you're hearing and you're following what I'm saying. And send some comments in the chat. Write that in. Eight ways to maximize and benefit from a crisis. I hope you got your notepads and your pens out or, your, or whatever you use to, to take notes because I really believe that this is going to help you. It really is. And these eight ways um, are taken again from my own life. So... At some point in my life, looking back on it, 
I've been through a couple of crisis situations in my life. I mean, it's it, all of us have. But the point we have to take away from each crisis situation is what we learn from it and what we can apply and what we can help share to others to help to help avoid help them avoid falling into the same trap or help them see it from a different perspective, right? Good. So eight ways to maximize and benefit from a crisis. You guys ready? Let's go. Number one. Number one. We have to remember, remember, keep this in your mind, remember that the crisis that you see, the crisis is not the real crisis. That may sound contradictory, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain it. Remember that the crisis is not the real crisis. Now, what do I mean by that? Yes, you may see a situation. Yes, you may have a, see an event, have a situation, have um, some unfortunate circumstance that has happened in your life. But understand that that, that that thing that happened is just that, a circumstance, a situation, or an event. The real crisis is determined by how we manage the change that is ushered in by the situation. So the crisis in itself is not the real crisis. The real crisis happens after. How do you manage the change that this particular situation, that this particular event, that this particular unfortunate circumstance has ushered in? How do we deal with that? How do you manage that? Because it is that, that space right there, that determines how long the effects of the crisis will last. The effects of the situation, the effects of the circumstance, the effects of the event, and how long you remain glued in that state. The crisis is not the real crisis. The real crisis happens or it is determined by how you manage the change that the situation, the unfortunate situation ushers in. So let's take, for example, um, Let's say you, are, uh, you, you, you end up in an accident. That is, that is an unfortunate situation, right? It's an unfortunate situation, a circumstance, an event that has happened to you. However, the real crisis is determined by how well you manage the change that that particular event ushered in. Whether it is you have to go to therapy, whether you need an operation, whether you have, uh, whatever it is, how you manage afterwards is what determines whether or not um, how de de it determines how long you stay in that state or how long the effects of that event will last on you. So in other words, don't wait for change to happen to you. You have to plan for change. Plan for it. Unfortunate situations will happen all the time. Let me just get, let me just get you to understand that. There's, there's such a, there is a such thing as Murphy's Law. It states, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. That is a crisis. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. Whether it's personal, national, or global, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. So our, our, our goal should be, how do we plan for those changes? Now, what is planning? Planning is the effective management of the time and the resources that are found in the distance between where you are now and where you want to be. Let me say that again. Planning is the effective management of the time and the resources that are found in the distance between where you are now, currently, and where you want to be. And it is in that space, the distance between where you are and where you want to be, that is the space where crisis can happen. So real crisis management, however, so then, so then real crisis management is determined by how well you can plan. And if real crisis management is determined by how well you can plan, if there is a plan and a crisis comes, then you can always tweak the plan. You can always rearrange certain details of the plan to ensure that you know, your decision-making capabilities and abilities are not um, compromised. 
Once you have a plan in place, it's, easy, it's, it's an easy tweak. However, if there is no plan and a crisis happens, then your decision-making capability and ability becomes a bit skewed and compromised because now you have to be focused on making a plan, uh, uh, coming up with things, uh, doing things on the spur of the moment instead of, okay, you know something? We plan for this. Now, even though I'm saying, you know, make a plan, you can't plan for every situation. Like, for example, you couldn't plan for some matter COVID-19. However, you could plan for health crises, whether it is global or in your country. Whether it's globally or personally, you don't know what the crisis could be, but you do know a crisis may happen, so you have to plan effectively. Okay, so if this happens, this is what we're going to do, because that is the real crisis. The real crisis is determined by how well you manage the change that is ushered in. So that's, so that's number one, right? The real crisis or the crisis that you see is not the real crisis. That's, that, 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 that's the first way that you can maximize and benefit from a crisis because that is a perspective shift. It's a perspective shift. Understanding the different dynamics, okay? That's one. Now, let's move on to number two. Number two, everybody with me, if, if, you, if, you, if you're there and you're watching and you're, and you're enjoying this, if this is making sense to you, put some hearts, put some comments and share, all right? Put some hearts, put some comments, and share, and type in the chat room. Number two, number two, the goal of crisis, the goal of crisis is not to cripple. Let me say that again. Somebody type that in the chat room. The goal of crisis is not to cripple. Times of crisis, whether they are personal, whether they are national, whether they are global, they are not meant to cripple you or anybody. It's not, it is not meant to cripple. What it is meant to do is push us into the future. Because sometimes we get complacent, sometimes we get lackadaisical, sometimes we get lazy. But crises happen to push us into the future. A present crisis, a present crisis is a future opportunity in seed form. Let me say that one again. A present crisis is a future opportunity in seed form. So in other words, we have to begin looking at the situations that happen to us, the circumstances that happen to us, the, um, the, the, the unfortunate um, events that happen to us. We have to start looking at them as, as, as future opportunities that are wrapped up in a seed. Because the seed, when you look at a seed, if I have a seed in my hand, if you can see a seed in my hand, uh, apple seed, mango seed, avocado seed, whatever seed you can imagine to your fancy, the seed, you cannot see the full potential of the seed. All you can see is the seed. But it is not until the seed is exposed and placed in the right environment that it can grow and expose what was inside of it. The same thing is with a crisis. A crisis, a present crisis is a seed for a future opportunity. Therefore, any crisis, personal crisis, um, global crisis, is a precursor to innovation and creativity because that is what the future is made of. So anytime we talk, anytime we have a discussion about crisis, we have to take into consideration that this is a future opportunity that is wrapped in a seed. So we have to change, if we need a paradigm shift to look at the crisis as, okay, this is, this is something that needs to be planted. What am I supposed to glean from this? Therefore, it is necessary for certain moments of crises to happen so that it can violently jolt us into productivity and purpose. I can say, for, uh, because of the COVID-19, let's use that as an example, here in my country, in St. Martin, we were violent, violently jolted into the information age. Where a lot of the things that we, 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 we knew we could have done online, we are now realizing that, listen, we have to implement it faster than we were prepared to do so. But 
crisis came to jolt us into that reality, to violently push us into that reality. A lot of people are working from home now. Not that it couldn't have been done before, but because we became so um, um, comfortable with how things were, COVID-19 came as a crisis to shake things up and push us into the future. So the goal of crisis is not to cripple. It's always to push into the future. It's always to launch into the future. It's a, and if, if, you, if you've been following me in any capacity, you always know that I say, I'm always talking about let's go to the future, to the future. Let's go to the future, right? We are to live in the future and visit the present. Live in the future, write that down. Live in the future, but visit the present. Because when you are in the future, you see what needs to be done and you can come back to the present, visit it, introduce it so that what you see in the future can come, become uh, a reality. All right. So that's number two. Number two is the goal of crisis is not to cripple. It is to push you into the future. Number three, the third way that you can maximize and benefit from a crisis is look for the opportunities for development within the crisis. Look for the opportunities for development within the crisis. Every crisis, every single one, brings with it opportunities for development. I don't care what it is. Every crisis brings opportunities for some sort of development in some capacity, in some area of your life, both spiritually and naturally. For example, um, I, I, and I'm going to be using the COVID-19 a lot because that's the current crisis that we are all, um, everybody in, around the world, we are faced with right now. In this COVID-19 experience, a lot of the world, majority, probably the entire world, is on lockdown mode, quarant self-quarantine for two weeks. So what are the opportunities for development within that? You can't go out, you can't socialize, you have to be, it's, it's social distancing. So what are the ways that you can find to develop? Spiritually, you can use that time to connect with God. You can use that time to, to draw near for those of us who are the Christian and um, kingdom persuasion uh, believers. You can use that time, as scripture says, to draw near to God through prayer, through fasting, through reading the word. You can use that time to draw near. You can also use that time to feed your mind with things that can help you develop, things that can help you um, um, uh, grow and, 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 and mature in your faith. If you're not of the Christian uh, um, uh, kingdom persuasion, you can also use the time to feed your mind to help you develop in whatever, whatever it is you want to do. Read what it is, whatever. You can find opportunities for development even within isolation, even within quarantine. You can find it. There are opportunities, but again, your eyes have to be trained to see the opportunities. If you only focus, if, if, if the crisis only has you focusing on the negative, then you're using the crisis incorrectly. Look for the opportunities to develop. You have to look at everything, everything now, everything in your life, your gifts, your talents, your hobbies, your skills. Look at all of that. Every single one of it with a fresh perspective. Don't just, don't, don't just look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, I know I had that. Um, yeah, okay, well, I can, yeah, I, can, I can speak. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I can write. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can bake. I can cook. I can, I can do whatever. Whatever it is that you are good at. Gifts, talents, I can sing. Uh, hobbies, skills. Because sometimes skills, you, have, you may have to learn to develop new skills in this, in this particular season in this particular time period. But look at everything and then make a list of it. Don't shortcut yourself. Write down every single thing that you can do, that you can think of. I write it down. And then begin increasing your knowledge in those areas. Because as you begin to increase your knowledge, what you are doing is you are storing it for future use. That is, what, that, that is what it means to retain information. You don't use it. It's like a computer um, when you download a certain software on it. 
like Microsoft Word or, 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 or Adobe Reader or whatever, whatever program you can think of. You don't use the program all the time, but the information is stored in the computer's memory so that when you need it, it's easy to recall. It's easy to open up. That's the same thing with um, uh, increasing your knowledge in those areas. So use the crisis to increase your knowledge in certain areas, in certain skill sets, in certain, um, in certain hobbies. In, in certain gifts, in certain talents, use that to build yourself spiritually and naturally. All right. So that was that was three. Use the opportunity. Use a crisis to look for opportunities to develop. Number four. We almost do. We almost there. Halfway through. All right. Number four. And this is a big one. All right. This is a very, very, very. This is a very huge one. Number four. Feel. The emotions of the crisis, but don't succumb to them. You said that one again. Feel the emotions of the crisis, but don't succumb to them. Let me say one more time, because I want you to get what I'm saying. Feel, feel. You're a human being. You are built to feel. Feel the emotions of the crisis, but do not succumb to those feelings. Now, every crisis brings some emotions with it. And some of those emotions include fear, panic, trauma, depression, grief, despair, frustration, anxiety, loneliness, worry, Hopelessness. All of those are feelings that are legitimately inherent within crisis situations, crisis circumstances, crisis events. And it's good to feel those emotions. Don't suppress them. Don't gloss over them. Don't ignore them. You got to feel it. Because if you don't feel it, and you don't channel it properly, you can't overcome it. You have to be able to feel the emotions. That's like saying, uh, what, what, okay, personal, personal example. One of the crises that, that, that happened to me was um, losing, losing my job. That was a crisis. And a range of emotions, you ha I had to feel them. I was angry. I was upset. Like, what in the world? How could how can you do this to me? And then fear started to, to creep in. Okay, so how am I gonna take care of my family? Uh, how am I going to how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do that? Um, you have this to pay, that to pay, school fee, mortgage, all of that. I had to feel those emotions and I had to process them properly. And that and, and I think that is that is a a major blockage to those of us of the African uh, diaspora. We don't know how to properly channel emotions. I'm gonna just park right there. We don't know how to channel our emotions properly. And therefore, when a crisis happens, our emotions get the best of us. And we succumb to the emotions, but we don't necessarily feel the emotion. To feel means to, to explore. Why is this particular situation causing me to react this way? That's what it means. And if you can't do that, then talk to somebody or get counseling if you have to. That is not bad. I think we've stigmatized counseling so much that a lot of us who really need it, Disdain it and despise it, but that's not the idea. It got because counseling helps you work through feel the emotions if you're not able to do it by on your own. If you're not able to process, take the time, get silent, say, okay, you know something. This is a situation has been happening. Why is it happening? Why do I always react that way? Why do I feel this way? Why is it? Why is this particular situation making me feel it? And if it's a recurrent situation, why is this particular situation always making me feel this way? 
We got to explore that. Feel the emotion of the crisis, of the situation, of the event, of the circumstance. But never ever succumb to it. Never ever succumb to it. Because once you succumb to the emotion, then all rational thinking goes out the window. And then you're not able to think clearly, you're not able to process rationally, you're not able to do anything that, that requires any sort of intellect or, or any, any, any sort of logic because you are ruled and governed by your emotions of the crisis. So talk to somebody, feel the emotions. Another, another example, personal example with that is uh, my wife and I, we lost a child. We had to feel that. And both of us, because we're two different human beings, processed it differently. She processed it her way. I processed it my way. But at the end of the day, you have to process those feelings and feel them, not suppress them. Because it does you no good. Especially in a crisis situation. All right? So that's number four. Feel the emotions of the crisis, but do not succumb to them. Feel the emotions, but do not succumb to them. Number five. And this is mostly for those of us who are of the kingdom persuasion, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this, is, this is more on the spiritual side. Your faith does not, does not, does not stop crises from happening. Your faith does nothing to stop a crisis from happening. On the contrary, the crisis happens to prove your faith, to prove what you say you believe, to prove if you do believe in the God that you say you believe in. That is what crisis does. James 1 and 3 says that the trying of your faith works patience. The trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, the crisis that comes to challenge your faith works, produces, develops patience. That word patience in the Greek means endurance. It, that's what it means. It means steadfastness. It means being constant, consistent. Now, Jesus said it right, um, really clearly, real clear. You will have troubles. It's clear. John 16 and 33. He said it. It's clear. Jesus said, we will have crises. Point blank. So just because you're a believer, just because you, you believe in the kingdom, does not exempt you from going through crisis situations. However, the promise is, even though we go through crises, he has overcome the world, period. So in other words, there is hope. In other words, there is life after the crisis. There is life after the crisis. So that means we have to use our faith not to necessarily pray against the crisis, but use our faith to remain steadfast and endure the crisis. Psalms 57 and 7 says this, I, my heart is steadfast, oh God, my heart is steadfast, I will sing and give praise. In other words, I, might, I, I will remain steadfast, I will remain, I will endure during this crisis and still look to you as my source. Because that, that is what I mean to sing and give praise. You're recognizing that there's a source that is bigger than you, that is outside of yourself. So you remain steadfast in the crisis knowing that this too shall pass. It shall not be like this. There is an end. To everything, there is a time. To everything, there is a season. That is one of the most beautiful promises because it means that as long as you're here on the earth, there is an opportunity for something to end. There is an opportunity for a crisis to come to an end as long as you're here on the earth. But that's what you have to use your faith for, to endure 
to remain steadfast. No matter how long it takes, you know the God you believe in will bring it to an end. Will cause you to come out of this crisis. As long as he says, I will meet you on the other side, it doesn't matter what storm happens, it doesn't matter what comes your way, as long as he says, let us go to the other side and I will meet you over there, then we know that even though there's a crisis on the sea, that happened with the disciples, the word of the Lord is, there is an expected end. Thoughts of good and not to harm. All right? So your faith doesn't stop the crisis from happening. It happens to prove your faith. Let's move on. Number six, I'm doing good on time. Doing good on time. Number six, you have to evaluate the crisis to determine if this crisis is a course correction. Now, let me explain that. Sometimes a crisis happens to point us back into the direction we were supposed to be going, but we got distracted. To evaluate means to examine carefully, to calculate, to judge, to look at in great detail. That's what evaluate means. And if you are to evaluate a particular crisis, uh, whatever it is in your life, then you have to look at it and determine if that crisis is a course correction. And we determine if it's a course correction by being honest, open, and transparent with ourselves. We have to consider our ways. What were we doing before? What are we doing now? What did we plan to do but didn't? Am I going in the, the same direction I was um, when I first started? Did I drift? My degree is in aviation, and, and, and one of the things that, um, excuse me, one of the things that we learn um, is that of course correction. And when an, when, a, when an aircraft is flying, when a pilot is flying, um, even though they go in a particular direction, there, there is something that, that happens um, where they have to course correct for um, deviations that happen when the wind is blowing against the aircraft. And I have to make what is called wind correction. So sometimes we have to make wind corrections on ourselves. Course corrections. Are we going in the right course? We always have to be constantly and consistently looking at um, um, dealing with uh, evaluating where, where our destination is. If we have even set a destination and evaluating where we are and determining if we are on the path, if we've deviated or drifted a bit and what we need to do to get back. We have to be honest open and transparent with ourselves about that as long as we're not honest as long as we're not open as long as we're not transparent and as long as we don't have people in our lives that can actually do that for us then we'll be going in directions that we're not supposed to be in so here are some questions that you can ask when considering if you need a course correction if this crisis has come to course correct you. Am I satisfied with where I am? That's a legitimate question. If you take if you're taking stock of your life, if you're looking at where you are, are you satisfied with where you are? It's a legit question, is it not? Are you satisfied with where you are? Do you have an idea or have you discovered what your purpose is? Now, again, if you know me, if you follow me in any capacity, you know that one of my biggest life messages is that of purpose. That's my biggest life message. It's been that way since 2012. For the last, what, eight, nine years. It, that, that has been, I mean, I wrote a book on it for crying out loud, purpose. So it, it must be a message that I really um, have taken to heart, taken consideration with. Do you have an idea what your purpose is? Because if you don't, then that means you really have no direction. You don't know where it is you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, it's like the Cheshire Cat said in, in Alice in Wonderland. If you, if you don't know which way you're going, then, um, how do you say? Uh, I think, oh, here's what it was. Alice asked the Cheshire Cat, which 
way do I go? The cat answered and said, well, it depends a great deal on where you want to get to. The ch Alice answered and said, well, it doesn't really matter where. And the cat interrupted her and said, well, then if, if it doesn't matter where, then it doesn't matter which way you go. If you don't know where you're going, then anywhere, any road will take you there. But if you have a purpose, I don't want to digress here because that's, that's, that's a purpose um, um, life feed. But if you don't have a purpose, then you are setting yourself up for immediate failure. And I'll just leave that one there. So do you have an that's a question to ask. Do I have an idea what my purpose is? Have I gotten distracted, discouraged, or deterred from the path that I was on? If you figure, if you know what your purpose is and you're going in a particular direction, but then things happen. Crises happen, yes. And these crises can happen and you can get distracted, dismayed, disappointed, discouraged. But you got to ask yourself, have, has this crisis taken me off of the path? Why? What caused it to happen? These are all questions that you need to ask yourself when you're considering your ways to determine if the crisis, whether it's a personal crisis, that you are a global crisis or a national crisis, to determine if that crisis is, has been set up to course correct you, to get you back to where you were supposed to be, but you weren't because you got distracted. I know from personal experience that many of the crises that has happened to me, I've evaluated and determined that, yeah, it was course correction. Many of the crises, course corrective crises. No, all of them may not be that way, but you have to take the time to determine that and ask yourself some of these questions. Last question. And these are not, this is not an all-inclusive um, list, but these are some of the questions. Am I in the same position this year that I, that I was in last year? And if you are in the same position, whether it's um, physically, whether it's financially, whether it's mentally, emotionally, whether it's physically, whether it's intellectually, if you are in that same position, then you have to ask yourself, why have I not developed? Say la. Evaluate the crisis. Ask yourself the tough questions, the honest questions, the open questions, the transparent questions, and give people in that, that you have um, as accountability partners or your circle, give them the responsibility to ask you these questions to determine if whether or not the particular crisis, that I mean, <laughs> very, very loose example, but that's what Job's friends were doing. They were asking him the tough questions. They were asking him the hard questions. They were asking him the honest questions, the open questions, the transparent questions. So much so to the point that Job started to actually believe what they were saying, but they were off kilter. They were, they were wrong because the crisis that God had allowed Job to experience had nothing to do with course correction, but it was to prove and try his faith, which is number five. All right, so... Evaluate the crisis to determine if this is a course correction for you. Number seven, measure the crisis against the change that it can and that it will bring. Let me tell you something here tonight, Facebook, and whoever will be watching on any other social medium. Let me tell you real, straight, and true. Every crisis... Every single crisis, every last one of them, every crisis brings change in our life. I don't care what kind of crisis it is, but whatever crisis you are facing, it will bring change. Why? Because crisis opens the door to the future. Crisis. Oh, I want you to picture this in your mind's eye. Crisis opens the door of the future and then change introduces the future to the present. Crisis opens the door. Crisis says, listen, I'm opening this door to the future whether you like it or not. And when he opens the door, change comes in and introduces that same future that is outside into the present. Now, why is that? Why do you have to measure the crisis? 
against the change because again the crisis will come to an end there is a time for everything the crisis will end so long after the crisis is over the change that it brought will still be here so what will the lasting changes be that's what you have to measure measure the change against the crisis measure the change against the crisis is that change positive or negative not all change that comes is negative i mentioned to you earlier that we lost a child that's a negative change we thought we were getting an addition to the family but in turn it wasn't we that's a negative change but you have to measure the change against the crisis and then when you do that when you determine whether it's a positive or negative change then you have to ask yourself this question again it's a paradigm shift it's a perspective shift how can i use this change whether positive or negative to my advantage and benefit my life benefit my family benefit my career business organization um department if you're a manager uh church your ministry your community whatever how can you use this change whether it's positive or negative to my advantage perspective shift how do you use a negative change Okay, how can, I, how can I use it to help people? How can I use it to make sure that some people don't go through this? How can I use it to make sure that this helps somebody else? How can I use it and learn from it so that it can benefit me in the future? That is the perspective shift we need to have. We need to be able to look at change and use it for our benefit. Use it for your benefit. A positive or negative, use it for your benefit. Measure the crisis against the change that it can and will bring. And when you measure it, then you can determine how to use it to your advantage. All right? That's number seven. And we're on the last one, number eight. Respond to the change rather than react to the crisis. Respond to the change rather than react to the crisis. Now, in the context of a crisis, there is, significant, there is a significant difference between reacting and responding, right? There's reacting and there's responding. A reaction is usually um, on the spur of the moment. It's usually um, ad hoc. It's usually, okay, something is happening, so now we, 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 we're putting in something in place to, to react to the event that happened. So it's, it's usually implemented after the event or the situation or the circumstance is either imminent or has already occurred. So we, so, so we are reacting to the crisis. We are reacting to the situation. However, our response is something that is usually thought and planned out as a possible plan of action before the event or the situation or the circumstance occurs. Let me go back over that again. A reaction is usually implemented after the event, the circumstance or the situation has occurred or is imminent, meaning that is it's shortly approaching. For example, where we live, we live in a hurricane belt, right? Uh, what usually happens is that when we get wind that there's a hurricane out, usually that's when things begin to be mobilized. But if you really think about it, you're reacting to an imminent crisis situation. You're just reacting to an imminent crisis situation. However, responding to the change means that, okay, you know, a hurricane is coming, so Depending on the, uh, on, on the severity of it, the category of it, you can expect um, this amount of damage. Okay, how are we going to respond to the X amount of homes that may be damaged? How are we going to respond to the X amount of offices or businesses that may, that may be remain closed? Now, these, all of these are responses that are usually thought and planned out as a possible plan of action before the event occurs, before the, the unfortunate situation or circumstance happens. That's responding to the change. 
And a lot of the times during crisis situations, we react to the crisis, we react to the situation, we react to the event, we react to the situation, but we don't respond to the change that it brings. And this ties back into the first point where it says the crisis is not the real crisis. The real crisis occurs or is determined by how well you manage the change that is ushered in by the event. So we have to focus more on dealing with and adapting to the change, responding to the changes that will happen. If you lose your job, are you reacting to the event or are you responding to the change? Have you thought out of a plan? If you fall sick, will you be reacting to the situation or will you or, or do you have a plan in place that you can respond with? If you're still here, <laughs> I know I haven't done this because I was in the zone, but if you're still here, throw some likes, throw some hearts. If you're understanding what I'm saying, throw some likes and some hearts up and comment. I um, need to know if you're still here and you're still following. I need to, I need to know if you're understanding what I'm saying. Does this, if it, it, does this make sense? You have to respond to the change, not react to the crisis or the event. And this requires a paradigm shift. It requires a change in your mental thinking, a change. Everything, all these eight ways that I've listed out have to do with a mental shift. Because the only way you can maximize and benefit from a crisis is if your mentality and your mind is, in a, is on a different level than where you are at. Does this make sense? So, one of my favorite quotes, and, we, and we're done. I'm going to open up for questions in a bit. One of my favorite quotes, one of my absolute favorite, I have several, but one of my favorite quotes is this by Eric Hoffer. It says, in a world of change, in a world of change, I love this quote, the learners shall inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I'll say that again. In a world of of change because remember the only thing that is constant in life is change and as long as you're in this world you will have trouble and you will have crisis and if you have crisis that means you will have changes and if you have changes that means that someone somewhere in the world is experiencing that right now as we speak so in a world that is replete with change it is the learners that shall inherit the earth. Those who are willing to change, those who are willing to adapt, those who are willing to take um, the crises and use it to their advantage, the learners, those who learn to use um, adverse situations. Uh, William Shakespeare has a quote that says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Those who learn to use adversity and make it work for them. The learners shall inherit the earth. While the learned find themselves perfectly suited and beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. A perfect example of that is Blockbuster. A per another example of that is the, switch, the Swiss watch company. Because they were unwilling to learn and adapt and keep up with, 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 with the times and the changes, the learners inherited the earth. Netflix inherited the earth. Digital watches inherited the earth. And put Blockbuster and the Swiss watch company out of business. The learners inherited the earth. While the learned, those who thought they knew it all, those who didn't want to adapt to change, those who were set in their ways, those who used crisis and looked at it as negative and always complained and didn't have a good thing to say about any decision that has been, those persons, the learned, find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. So what this means is this. If we don't know how to deal with any crisis we face, we will always find ourselves on the side of irrelevance. 
We will always find ourselves on the side of irrelevance if we don't find a way to learn from, maximize, and benefit crisis. Benefit from crisis. We will always find ourselves on the side of irrelevance in a world that we no longer recognize because that world won't exist. Does that make sense to you? Does that, let me know if that makes sense. Those were the eight ways that you can maximize and benefit from change. Or benefit from a crisis, I should say, sorry. Benefit from crisis. Because crisis will come. And like I said, we, as millennials, we're going to live at least 50, 60, 40, 50, 60 more years. So there's no possible way that we won't face another crisis, whether it's personal or global. So we have to know, have to learn, have to realize, have to understand, have to recognize how to deal and learn from and benefit and maximize the crises that we will face. And these eight ways... I'm not saying that it's all inclusive, but what I am saying is that if you employ them, if you follow them, if you, if you put them into practice, you can benefit from any crisis you will face. You can benefit from, from any crisis. All right. So what were they again? All right. Well, let me repeat them. Number one. The first crisis is that the crisis is not the crisis. Remember that. Okay? The crisis is not the real crisis. Number two. Uh, crisis is not meant to cripple you. Alright? The goal of crisis is not to cripple Number three, look for the opportunities for development within the crisis. Number four, feel the emotions of the crisis but do not succumb to them. Number five, your faith does not stop crisis from happening. Number six, evaluate the crisis to determine if this is a course correction for you. Number seven, measure the crisis against the change it can and will bring. And finally, number eight, respond to the change rather than react to the crisis. Now, with that being said, I'm going to open up for questions. If you have any questions regarding this um, crisis change continuity, are uh, the eight ways uh, to maximize and benefit from a crisis shoot them in the chat right now I'm going to open up for questions for a few minutes like I said I wanted to be on for a, for an hour and we're coming up on that so i just leave a few more minutes um, I want to respect your time and I'll give a few minutes for questions and answers and if there's no questions and answers then I'll just call it a night and let you go back to being uh, quarantined <laughs> alright so shoot your questions Any questions? <clears throat> Unless I'm not seeing it, I'm not sure what's going on. <clears throat> Looking to see if there's any questions. Um, I don't see anything. Well, if there are no questions, guys, I will call it a day, call it a night. Yes. Yes, that's a question. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not... No, oh, okay. Well, well, what's, what's the question? Asks, how can you go about making negative situation an opportunity? This is from Liz. 
how can you go about making a negative situation tell me the question again how can what how can you go about making a negative situation an opportunity how can you go about making a negative situation an opportunity okay good question good question is all right one of the one of the things you have to take into consideration is that every every negative opportunity is a seed every crisis is a seed um, that was something we dealt with before every crisis is a seed so you just have to be able to excuse me evaluate the situation that you are in and extract the things that you can learn from it so that it can be beneficial to either you or anybody that is in your sphere so for example um let's say you are in a situation that um Let's say you, you end up in an accident, God forbid, right? And that, that it's a negative situation, obviously. And you have to be a, and now you are uh, confined to a wheelchair for a period of time and undergo therapy. That's a negative situation. You lost your mobility. But in that negative situation, what could be some positive, positives that come out of it? Now you, you, you become reacquainted with, with yourself. You become reacquainted with um, your body. You become reacquainted with uh, how you can... Um, how to learn again um, you have time now that you are uh, before maybe you were busy extremely busy and now this this has taken you uh, put you back so that you can now relax take some time and begin to develop yourself those are so that that is one of the ways you can turn a negative into a positive look for the situations in it I know it's easy to look at the, the, the negatives. I know it's easy to look at um, what is happening right now. But remember, the goal of a crisis, point number two, the goal of a crisis is not to cripple you. Remember that, right? So if it's not to cripple you, then you have to be able to change your perspective to look and see, okay, what is in this situation? Because I think there's a, ver um, again, for those of us who are of uh, Christian persuasion, there's a verse in Psalms, I can't remember exactly what it is, where it says, it paraphrases and it says that whatever happens, God allowed it. So if he allowed it, there must be a purpose for it, a reason for it. And if Romans 8.28 stands true, which is something I believe, all things work together for good, then that means we have to look for the good that is in a negative situation. All things. What is left out of all? Nothing. So that means good and bad. All things, good and bad, work together for good. So if it's going to work together for good, that means we now have to train ourselves to see the good in the situation. Now, what that looks like for you, I have no idea. But that is something now that you and God will have to take up and begin to deal with and, and wrestle with and discuss so he can show you the good that can come out of this situation. Because again, um, James says that, I have the, the, talking about Job, he says that Job, um, there was an end intended by the Lord. And if you read Job, we see the end was to bless him doubly. So even though he was going through negative situations, the end intended was uh, um, good, intended for him. Jeremiah 29, 11, the, the thoughts are not of evil. So even though you're in a negative situation, look for the good. Use, use Romans 8, 28 and look for the good. Because if all things work together for good, then there must be good somewhere in that negative situation. Hope that makes sense. If there's if any, because I can't see the questions, guys, so I don't know what's going on. So I'm I'm relying on my wife to let me know what the questions are. I don't know why I can't see them. No, because I, I didn't realize when I shared it, it created um, my own um, a watch party. Watch party. Ah, okay. But I have no, guys, I have no idea why I can't see. Sure, Mel Grant uh -huh. has to post the eight ways again. Okay. All right. Well, she came in late, so. Okay, no problem. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat them, uh, but you can also, I'll leave the replay up so you can go back over it. You can catch the replay. Um, but number one, all right, the eight ways to maximize and benefit from a crisis uh, for Ms. Shermel Grant. Number one, realize and remember that the crisis is not the real crisis. 
all right? Now, again, I'm just going to go through the points, but you'll have to watch the replay to get the explanation. Number one, the crisis is not the real crisis. Number two, the goal of crisis is not to cripple. These are ways that you can maximize and, and, and benefit from crisis by realizing that the goal of crisis is never to cripple you. Excuse me. Number three, look for the opportunities for development within the crisis. There are always opportunities. There are always opportunities for development. And uh, come, let me just slip that in to answer Liz again. Um, even though there's a negative situation, there are opportunities in that negative situation for you to develop. So use, use the crisis situation, the negative crisis situation, as a development platform. Look at it that way. Number four, feel the emotions of the crisis, but do not succumb to them. Feel the hurt, feel the pain, feel the anger, the frustration, the anxiety, feel it, but do not succumb to it, All right? Again, watch the replay for the explanation. <laughs> Number five, your faith does not stop crisis from happening. I know that's, all, that, that's probably a, the biggest misconception within um, the church and, and in Christendom and within the kingdom. But your faith does not stop a crisis from happening. All right? Number six, evaluate the crisis to determine if this is a course correction for you. Okay? Number seven, measure the crisis against the change that it can and will bring. Take the crisis, the situation, the event, the circumstance, and measure it against the change that it can bring and that it will bring and evaluate and, 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 and evaluate it. Measure it and see because again, you know, when we talk about change, long after the crisis is over, the change will be there. So what so what are you gonna focus on? The crisis or are you gonna focus on the change? Measure it. See which one is more important. And eight, respond to the change rather than react to it. So those are the eight ways that you can maximize and benefit from a crisis. Mm -hmm. Maybe that first question of Liz, um, maybe we can maybe go a little deeper with, the, with that question in terms of how to make a negative situation an opportunity by us remaining focused on our purpose. That's a good point. If, if, if the focus is on your purpose, God has equipped us with purpose uh, so that we can have a negative turnout. It's a, it's it's always a positive thing. So if her if she wants to know how to maintain or how to stay focused on an opportunity, uh -huh. then she may want to stay focused on the purpose. And even though the crisis may come to change the course of direction, um, if purpose is her focus, mm -hmm. then she's gonna be attracted to the things that's gonna keep her. Focus there. So maybe you can elaborate on that. She has another question too. She has another question. Okay, let me just elaborate on that. That is that is a very very good point. That is a purpose webinar, uh, a purpose live stream that I probably probably will do because I already have the material for it. Uh, but just to answer it, yes, if you if you are aware of purpose, purpose is in my opinion the safeguard against falling into some sort of um, um, let me say it this way purpose protects you all right and if you and if and if you are purpose driven then your mentality is always such that you are looking at how this can romans 8 28 all things work together for good and that is by far probably my top 10 favorite scriptures top five because of my belief in the concept of purpose. All things work together. So using negative situations, if you are focused on purpose, if you're focused on purpose, then every situation, you can always look at it and say, okay, you know something? God, this, this has to turn around to, to help fulfill purpose. But if you don't know purpose, then every time a crisis hits, you'll be tossed to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, all right? So purpose is one of the anchors that can help you 
overcome negative situations and see the positive in it so that you're able to continue to go forward and, 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 and prosper. But you know something? That is a purpose live stream and I will plan, uh, I will do one of those um, eventually, soon. Look out for it, purpose. Next question from Liz. Another question, what do you think we should think about during this whole corona situation? What do I, this is from who? Um, Liz. Okay. What, what do you think we should focus on or think about in this corona situation? Okay. What do I think we should think about? <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me say it like this. What we should not think about is the coronavirus. That's what we should not be thinking about. All right. We should be thinking on life after the coronavirus. Because again, um, China has already said that they have no new reported cases. So that means um, that eventually this whole thing will eventually dissipate and, and become under control. So for those of us who, who are keeping an eye out, we should have been preparing for life after Corona. So what we should be thinking about is how are we going to maximize what is what is happening right now? If you if you look at the world, if you look if, if you look at what's happening, things are off balance, things are off kilter, prices have dropped. Uh, There's a perfect opportunity to get in and begin focusing on what is called the spoils of war. This is something that um, during uh, our last um, gathering at, at church that that that, that was mentioned about the spoils of war. We have to begin thinking about life after Corona. How are we going to rebuild, quote unquote, our lives? Because again, the world has changed. Everything is now, you know, and, and we now see that a lot of things that we were, we were saying that could not be done were possible. So now how do we capitalize on this and ride this wave? That's what we should be thinking about. In addition to, I think it's Philippians 4, 8, what sort of things are good, lovely, um, uh, a good report, um, whatever is a virtue, whatever is, whatever is a praise, think on these things because you have to continuously keep your mind focused and, 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 and geared towards things that can actually help you develop and move forward. All right? So that is what I think we should be thinking about. That is what I have been thinking about. Um, how do I capitalize on this? Um, this two-week period, we, we, we shouldn't look at it as, as um, jail time, so, so to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm busy writing another book. I mean, it's, it's, um, I've been, but now that I have two weeks, it's almost like, yo, it's the perfect time to put work in. Everybody is home, you're home, you're here with me, you've been on with me for an hour and 15 minutes almost, well, probably an hour because we started at uh, about five minutes after, so probably a, a little over an hour, but we're here, you know, so these are, these are opportunities, all those who are creatives, this is your opportunity, you got to put content out, for the next two weeks people are home all over the world, put stuff out, make sure that you are, you are poised and in position to be able to um, capitalize on this season. That's what I think you should be think, thinking about. Life after this, because it's 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 will it will pass. It is passing. So yeah, that's what I think you should be thinking about. I don't know, are there any more questions? I don't know why I can't see the questions. That don't make no sense to me. Oh, no, but I thought, I thought, you know, when people, I can see people comment, but I can't see the questions. Oh, I think I get what you're saying. Because you, oh, yeah, yeah slow moment. Sorry, 
uh, she had a watch party on her profile. Um, so she's seen the questions come through on her profile, but I can't see the questions on the live that I'm on. So that's the um, that's the problem. The people that are on for you are not asking any questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, no problem. If no one wants to ask any questions on the live, then I guess uh, again, like I said, I want to be respectful of your time. And actually, um, we're about an hour and ten minutes over, or ten minutes over, I should say. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for indulging me. I appreciate you coming on, and. Um, yeah, so these were the eight ways that you can maximize and benefit from a crisis. And with that being said, I bid you a good night. Enjoy the rest of the time with your family if you have one. Or if, you, if you're not, enjoy your time with Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus or whatever, whatever it is you, 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 you're using to keep your company. And I'll see you again on another live. All right. Peace.